Yeah, and putting together a festival like Dresden is a bit like creating a crossword puzzle. I think, you know, there are so many possibilities, many clues, but only one kind of outcome. And I use the crossword analogy because this year's festival, the watchword, if you like, for it is a four-letter word beginning with T, which affects all human experience, time. I'm curious to know how you arrived at this idea for the festival. Well, putting together the program is really my most fun part, and uh, the theme time always interested me in many different aspects. As a player, uh, when I play, how does time pass in my own experience and in the experience of the audience? And I think there are some players or conductors or groups who can make us forget the time or have the time pass much faster, so they are kind of magicians of time. Mm. Of course, I invited some of those mag magicians. <laughs> and then the other part is that music is strongly connected to the time when it's composed, when it's created. And I've always thought that this was undervalued, this fact, among players, among audiences. They love certain pieces, but why do we love them so much? Or why do we like Beethoven so much? Because I think of the French Revolution. Or why do we like Shostakovich so much? Because he composed the 20th century, the whole history of 20th century. What's about Bach? Yeah, Bach was a genius, but also he was the composer who basically composed the Protestant religion. And then there's the other music which is not connected to the time and doesn't care about the time. I'm talking about the late romantics like Elgar or yeah, yeah. people like this who ignore their time or Richard yeah. Strauss. And that's also interesting because what makes them ignore the time? Yeah. What makes them dare to compose in a style which is long gone? So all these aspects always, I thought, were under accented in programs of festivals and so that was a theme I had in mind for a long time and I was very much looking forward to focus on time. You have a quote here which says a good concert always provides us with a magical intellectual discourse between the past and the future. Can you elaborate on that statement? I think if uh, we hear some great interpretation which uh, brings us back to the time when the piece was composed that's the start of it but then I think without relating to us to the time we are living in and perhaps giving us some vision for the time forward that would be not so valuable so I think um, somebody who now digs out some new details about a piece which was composed in the 19th century and presents it to us with enthusiasm and with competence and at the same time with maybe a vision who would listen to that piece tomorrow. Mm. You know, that is something which I feel sometimes in a great concert, that those people are not just looking back to the time and not just interested how it sounded when it was composed, but they are very much interested in how it will sound in 100 years. Your opening concert is interesting because it's an all-night affair, which I suppose is giving people the experience of experiencing music both in different acoustics and different parts of the venue. What is the venue for It's that? the Deutsche Gede Museum, and it's a very interesting museum where there was the first exhibit of a woman in basically a glass sculpture where you could see all the organs. Uh -huh. And that was in the 1920s, so the building has an interesting architecture. So of course... Uh, the Nazis tried to misuse the museum very much, and after the time, the communism came. So it's a very interesting history of the building, and also shows us very much what happened in that short amount of time between the 1920s and our time now. Yes. Mm. So you're using different parts of this building, and the audience can move around from event to event. Is that the idea, and kind of lose themselves? In... Well, there's a main act, which is the Michael Nyman Band, and we are going to have a, a program which is a bit longer than an hour, but then you can walk around and you will find in one room a dancer who is dancing just for herself without music, or you will find a choir which sings between Bach and Nyman, or you will find all kinds of different things. You will hear Satie's work. Uh, These the kind piano. of installation ideas, they're almost like art exhibits, but from a feeling point of view. Uh, becoming more and more popular. I mean, it happens here quite a lot. There are theatre companies that take over a warehouse 
and they create an environment where you move around and not necessarily in one order. You might find yourself at the part of the play that comes from later on and you have to piece it all together by you know, putting it in sequence for yourself. That sounds like an extraordinary idea for music. Well, for us, it's also very important that the festival opens every year in a different location with a different idea. Yeah. Sometimes we have the Zemper Oper with Barnboim and uh, Wagner Strauss program, and sometimes we have, um, like last year, we went to a big building with a kind of a hall which is used for all kinds of things. It's a fair, there are pop concerts and, you know, large space, almost 3,000 people. And we opened with a community dance project. And we wanted to show that everybody's welcome for the festival and everybody come to the opening night. And so we had an audience really from people who were the parents of these kids in some difficult schools. And probably 10% of the people in that concert opening night have never been to a concert, I mm-hmm. assume. That's so it. you have a very different focus every year, sometimes glamour, sometimes community. And this time is very much created to fit the theme and to introduce the theme to the audience. And that's why we're also taking our time for that night. <laughs> and you mentioned Michael Nyman, who was a British pioneer in minimalism. He's best known for his marvellous scores for the Peter Greenaway films, particularly the first being The Draftsman's Contract. But it was response minimalism, wasn't it, to an age of overcomplication and exclusivity in contemporary music, just as Schoenberg's serialism was a response to excess in romanticism. And it was a kind of cul-de-sac. I don't know that it was ever going to lead anywhere, but it was good to clear out everything and freshen things up. I kind of like minimalism. Uh, I always was attracted to the pieces which have that repetitive patterns, like Steve Reich, because he combined it with a lot of color. And so does Michael Nyman. If you hear the Greenaway scores, I also got to know him through those films, of course, when I was a young guy and saw these um, films, and the music is just heartbreaking sometimes. And it's simple, but yet there is a lot of color. So if you repeat a lot of patterns of the same notes, you got to change the harmony so you have to make the harmony so beautiful that it can last yeah. for let's say 150 bars yeah and for me steve reich and also michael nyman they both achieved something that really time stands still because these yeah. bars repeat and repeat and you hear that color and you're touched very much deeply and with steve reich is often the scores which are connected to history and with Michael Nyman, it's more, I don't know if I may, should say that, but beauty of the 80s or something, yeah? It's, <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. little bit that time picture, and um, it's a very different music from Steve Reich, I, but it's I still remem- the same tradition. I remember in a Z and Two Nords, the time-lapse sequence with the decaying animal, which he wrote this extraordinarily hypnotic music for. And that seemed to me to crystallize this idea of, certainly in your festival, how minimalism relates to time. So that will be fascinating. got things like happening in the night concert you've got Satie's vexations which is that famous epic piano piece which goes on for what is it 15 hours or something it's something like that different overnight. pianists will take over from each other yeah, if you come you can stay in the <laughs> museum can camp there and sleep there yeah. with the music in the background so so we want to provide more open idea about an opening night now i, I noticed messian's quartet for the end of time in the program And, you know, that was a kind of of end-of-day scenario. And because it was premiered in a prison camp during the war, this links in very nicely to another aspect of the festival this year, which is war, refugees, but also Israel, the Jews, and particularly pertinent with regard to the Second War and Dresden in particular. So could you reflect on that a little? Because... um, the Jews had a highly developed sense of irony, which is tapped into by people like Mahler and Shostakovich. In fact, their music would be inconceivable without that element. And Dresden was an intellectual city with a lot of Jewish artists, but also lots of 
wealthy businessmen before the war who would sponsor the arts. Without the wealthy dealers in, in Dresden who would deal in art, all this, this would have never been the same cultural scene. Uh, it was almost as vibrant as Berlin at, in the 1920s. It was a, a fabulous art scene. And if we uh, now talk about time, I think to remember is very important. To remember the mistakes we made and not to make them again. I think particularly in this time while we have these demonstrations of the so-called anti-Islamic groups uh, in Dresden still going on. And they were going on last year and I thought we need to show these people that we can't repeat time and we can't fall in the same patterns. And uh, for me, the residency of the Israel Philharmonic playing Mahler together with musicians from Dresden. We are doing Mala 8, Symphony of the Thousand. So it's, we bring together choirs and uh, instrumentalists from Dresden with the Israel Philharmonic, and mm -hmm. we go to the biggest church we have, to the Kreuzkirche, which was destroyed in the war, burned out. And you can still see inside that there's no decorations. It's just a gray color throughout the church. It's a beautiful, large space. And the Israel Philharmonic is going to play there. And also they're going to give a concert with Arabic and uh, Jewish folk music mixed yeah. in the program to show that if you're anti-Islam, you're not necessarily pro-Jewish. <laughs> you are a racist. Basta. Yeah. And I think for me it was very important to bring that aspect of time history and a dark times of history and we don't pass it on to the younger generation. People are going to make the same mistakes. Whether in Germany, I actually don't fear that much that we would fall in such a dark time again in Germany ever, but in the world, definitely. I noticed that Israel are also playing the Shostakovich Sixth Symphony, which is a very interesting choice for me because the Sixth was the symphony that was expected to be, from the authorities' point of view in Soviet Russia, the Lenin Symphony. And that was the word that got around. And it opens with this very searching slow movement. And then you've got these two circus turns. And there's no question in my mind that Shostakovich was playing tricks on the authorities, setting up expectations with the slow movement at the beginning that this was going to turn into a great epic in praise of Lenin, and it ends up being a parody. And I think because those tunes are so Jewish, I'd be very interested to hear what they bring to that sense of irony that that piece has in spades. <laughs> So you've got the Jerusalem Quartet playing um, three quartets from the beginning, the middle and the end of the Eighth Quartet, the War Quartet. The great thing about Shostakovich music is he has very much incorporated the Western avant-garde of the 1920s, 19, early 1930s, uh, like Paris and Berlin and Kurt Weill and you know, all this satie, everything. Mm -hmm. He knew that stuff. Mm -hmm. He wanted to incorporate it always. Same time, he was always worried that the Russians would find him way too Western, and they did, after Lady Macbeth of Minsk, or some other moments in his career when the authorities said, okay, that's enough, that's too Western. Yeah. And then he would, as you said, he would code hide, it. Yes. he would code it, <laughs> or at moments, which I also find wonderful, like the Leningrad Symphony, when really Russia was threatened by the Nazis or by the attack from outside, then he would become a patriot, yes. a true patriot. And that's so beautiful that he could be sincere in the moment when the Russians were attacked. He said, okay, this is too much. Now I'm all for whatever yeah. we are fighting the enemy. And, and then he goes back to the exactly. Cold War and again yeah. goes into hiding. And yeah. you know, this is very interesting. And you can sense story. when yeah. he's being sincere. You yeah. can sense when he's telling the truth. Right, exactly. And you can spot the lies a mile off as well, right. which is so fascinating. It's that subtext. Yeah, and you're it? right. It's just so much mu Jewish music in his compositions and Jewish tunes, plasma tunes. Mm -hmm. While he was not Jewish, he had, I think, so many Jewish friends. I think he even said at some point, he said, if you are against Jews in Russia, you can count me as a Jew. I think it was just a quote yes. who said that. Uh, and that's a very interesting quote. I would do definitely sign the same thing ever for all, this, for all occasions. <laughs> I 
I also think that having the Boston Symphony and Andres Nelsons, who I think is a tremendous talent, what he's doing with that orchestra is staggering. They're doing Mahler's Holocaust, really, the Ninth Symphony. That kind of fits in too, ties in with... with yeah, and before we do the Colney Drive by Bruch, and it's also a little irony of history that Max Bruch was condemned by the Nazis because of that piece, which is a prayer of a young Jewish man, mm. Yom Kippur, and um, he was not Jewish. So just because of that composition, which was in favor of a Jewish theme and Jewish holiday, he got condemned and his music was not played. Mm. by the Nazis. International character is important to you, obviously, when you're putting together a music festival, because it's music without borders. Music is supposed to transcend all those divides, political, religious. I think you did Leonard Bernstein's Mass, didn't you, one year? Or are you thinking of doing it? We are it? thinking of doing it in because the Bernstein that is, year. That is coming. precisely what it's about. But we did Quiet Place by Bernstein last year, which was very interesting. That's Kent Nagano. That's and that's the opposite, it's a family story, a twisted family story, but it's also about tolerance and understanding. And I think it's always the same thing. Tolerance, understanding doesn't start in a big sense of communities or countries or governments. It starts really in, within your family, within your friend circle and on the street when you meet someone. So it starts everywhere in the one-to-one -one relation between people. You yourself are playing the Schumann Cello Concerto twice. Was that happenstance or coincidence or deliberate? Because I'm fascinated what the thinking was behind that. Well, it was a coincidence. The coincidence was that the Singapore Symphony, which is coming to the festival and uh, is playing with Gilshaham in Dresden, also we chose them to be our ambassadors for our Berlin concert. We do every year Berlin concert to invite politicians in the government and to do a little lobby work for the festival in the capital. And also we want to show the Berliners said it's just a short ride to Dresden and come to the festival. And then the Singapore Symphony couldn't play with Gil in Berlin because he had another concert with one of the other orchestras. And since I played with the orchestra, I, I don't know, some 50 times in the last 15 years and many tours and everything, so they asked me, can you play with us Schumann? I said, yeah, I do have that in my repertoire during the festival, but on gut strings. So I'm, I'm playing with the Singapore Symphony on steel strings and later with the Dresden Festival Orchestra on gut strings. And I actually now think I'm very happy about that. I can focus on this piece during the festival because I have lots of other work. And it's a piece I know very well. And I can maybe learn from playing parallel at home gut strings, steel strings, mm. gut strings, steel strings. <laughs> You're recording it with your festival orchestra, the Dresden right. Festival, which is pride and joy, really, of the festival. And that's a, basically a period band, is it? It's a period band, but it's one of the strongest groups for the 19th century. And as we look at the scene of period instruments in Europe, we have a lot of great groups for 18th century. For 19th century, it doesn't look that great. And it's very difficult. You need that mix of authenticity, power, yeah. virtuosity, and so we asked the committee of uh, musicians from the scene, because I could never do that job myself, said put together the best players you can find in Europe from all these groups, from London, Paris, Vienna, Freiburg, Berlin, Amsterdam, wherever they are, and try to help us to create an orchestra which is especially good with 19th century, yeah. which is so different in the playing style. In performance practice. Or even 20th century. Uh, yeah, 20th really century. We, we, yeah, we went up to Strauss already with the orchestra. <laughs> yes. And I waited five years. I didn't want to collaborate with the orchestra. First of all, I didn't want to disturb them in their development. Also, I wanted to really see where it goes and also not get involved artistically too early. And then last year, we had that creative explosion, I would call it, when they played Schumann's Second Symphony. The house came down and lots of people also it's who came from piece. very far away mm -hmm. said that is perhaps the best group they have heard for 19th century on period instruments mm -hmm. and that made me think I thought, 
maybe we should document it. We should have more going on now and push the orchestra a little further in terms of exposure. Yeah. So we scheduled a lot of things for the next few years and intensifying the investment into the orchestra. But at the same time also, I was tempted when the musicians asked me, they said, well, if we record the Schumann Second Symphony, can we record also the Schumann Concerto with you? And I was first skeptical because I do play gut strings, but I'd never played further than Beethoven on gut strings. A triple concerto I play, I play 18th century stuff, but I haven't really tried Schumann yet on gut strings. And I dug out my old uh, Casals recording because I know that Casals still used gut strings. Well, he was a romantic player of the 20th century, but the gut strings just sound fabulous on his Schumann concerto. So I... I envision something that, that we find a, a new mix of authentic phrasing of 19th century and close to Schumann's concept, hopefully, but at the same time also find a more glorious sound on the gut strings with the orchestra and on the solo cello then. Are you fascinated by this composer generally? Very much. I mean, Schumann was always one of my favorite composers, yeah. and yeah. I always thought he was entirely underrated, even in Germany, if you... Uh, compared to Brahms or Beethoven, yeah. I thought Schumann was just as great in every aspect, for, perhaps for me more fascinating than Brahms. Mm. And the cello concerto has always come in important moments in my life. It was my debut in Berlin when I replaced Henry Schiff. I was about 20, 21 years old. And it was my first performance, actually, of the piece with orchestra. <laughs> and then uh, it came very often. I went on tour with Giuseppe Sinopoli, I played it at least 20 times with him, and I played it for my New York debut with Roy Mazel. I think now, with the gut strings, it's a really new challenge for me to work on. And about 15 years ago, I already recorded it once with the Munich Chamber Orchestra, and we already tried to trim it in terms of phrasing and more transparency, more looking at the score, regional bowings, and all those stuff. So maybe now, 15 years later, it's time to, to try again. <laughs> Extended your contract in Dresden for uh, as director of the festival, and you must already be planning next year and the year beyond. You already mentioned the Bernstein centenary, which I, I have a vested interest in. You have to put certain things in place. How do you get them to fit as your idea formulates as to what the theme or the focus will be on that year? It must be very, very difficult because people need to be booked two, three years in advance these days. Yes and no. I mean, for me, it's like playing the cello. You play, and you practice, and then you go to the rehearsal, and you judge yourself. You say, ah, something is missing, you know. I'm, I have had the piece down, and it sounded pretty good with the orchestra, but I'm not quite catching this or that, or there's something missing, and you add it. Mm -hmm. You try to use your experience, and maybe it's color, maybe it's tempo, maybe it's mm -hmm. structure. You know, there's so many things. Sound, you, you can play with so many different elements. And with a program, it develops slowly, and sometimes I'm very dissatisfied, let's put it this way, not unhappy, but dissatisfied. We have a program meeting, and in the, in the program meeting, basically, I read down the program thinking, like, something is missing, you know, we miss... Either it's a big orchestra with a very dramatic piece or with a fantastic conductor who we know will reinvent the piece, or it's the smaller things which uh, create the program and the theme and carve out the dramatic course through the program of the festival. So it's very much a creative work, I would say, and I have two wonderful artistic administrators who help me do that. And most of the time, you know when it's done, when it's ready. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just found its own architecture, and I find architecture and music very important, also very important in programs. I don't like programs which are a little bit like a sausage, you know, you read through and think, okay, another thing, another thing, but you don't really get that it's one big concert. For me, it's very inspiring altogether. That's why I extended my contract, because I feel uh, working on one festival in one city, I get to know all the venues, my audience, the city with, with its political problems, with the problems in society now, like the anti-Islamic demonstrations, and how we can angle that and how we can, as a festival, invest to make 
trace interpretation and also the people more fulfilled and everything rounds up to be an experience for all of us, I think. And creating these one-off experiences must be very satisfying because I grew up listening to a lot of recordings, but I started going to concerts quite early. But as I get older, I'm less interested in recordings and much more interested in that moment when you go into a concert hall. It will never be the same again. That performance you hear is a one-off and the next one will be different. Absolutely, you're right. And I think my first festival, I will never forget that I took a big risk. Uh, I don't know if you know the Frauenkirche in Dresden, but the church was destroyed and re-erected and was opened 10 years ago. And I played the Schumann <laughs> concerto <laughs> at that occasion too. And I still remember this very much. And then Valery Gergev was coming with the Vienna Philharmonic and said he wants to do a Firebird and a Bruckner one. And we didn't have the Zemper Oper and we only had the Frauenkirche. And I thought, okay, what do we do? And I called up Valerie, and he said, oh, we do it in the front because why not? I thought, like, Firebird in the front because it was that long reverb. And also the subject, you know, church in the church. And also the Bruckner one, I thought this would be like, my head will be sliced off and, you know. <laughs> and sure enough, for that particular concert, there were about 15 critics from all over the world. It was a group of American critics who had a conference in Dresden. And I went for lunch with Valerie and I talked to him and I said, you know, how the church was destroyed and how magic the idea is of bringing music to this place, which didn't exist anymore because of the wounds of the war and was re-erected with the positive energy of people. And he loved that so much, and I think the orchestra was motivated somehow. And there was this slight lightning in the background when the firebird was happening, and the critics and all these people came to me after the concert and said, one of the most magic experiences in their lifetime, in that church, that particular piece oh, yeah. with this orchestra with these artists and I think the orchestra was so satisfied and they came many times to the festival but they always mentioned that concert and there was a moment that happened we took a big risk but we did it wholehearted and we tried to create something special in this moment and we can never predict exactly when those moments happen but I think in each festival we have quite a few of those and I see the sparkling eyes of the audience when they walk out and then I think it's worth all the energy we put into the festival. Thank you.